we now look at more detail with regard to electric generators. So an electric generator induces an EMF and therefore produces electricity by rotating a coil of wire in a magnetic field. So the magnetic field is provided by external magnets um, and usually permanent magnets. And then a coil of wire is rotated about some axis. Now, the drawing in your book has a bit more detail than this one does, but you have wire coming up, forming a square, so some air loop area A coming down. That wire, imagine this square is like this dry eraser, and then I can, just the outer boundary here, and then I can rotate that square in space around some central axis. So the central axis is vertical, so the wire has one length L along the sides, the top and the bottom are with W, but since the rotation axis is along that, basically each side of the top from the rotation axis is distance W over two, half the width. Now we learned from motional EMF that the EMF generated is equal to the magnetic field strength times the length of the wire times the velocity at which we pull out that, uh, we, the velocity at which we change, basically, we, we move in the EMF. Well, this, since it's rotating, since theta is changing, we add another term theta to this. Because the angle, again, if this is the wire, the face plate, the angle of perpendicular to the surface or normal to the surface, as this rotates, that angle changes. So the angle with respect to the magnetic field and the opening changes with time. So what will happen is this becomes a sinusoidal equation. As this rotates at some angular frequency omega, the electric field, sorry, the EMF generated will increase, decrease, increase, decrease, and we'll get alternating current. Now, each side, each wire here, length L, length L, is generating an EMF. So we end up with twice what we had before. Now, on the right-hand side, I have some abbreviations, right? Theta is the angle between the normal to the surface and the magnetic field that changes with time. How fast does it change with time? Well, that's omega, right? This is the angular speed. Angular speed times time gives you the angle, just like velocity times time gives you the position. This goes back to the angular or rotational kinematics equations from physics 141. So you might want to go back and refresh some of those equations in your mind. The velocity of this wire, because this wire as it rotates, this edge is moving, in this case, towards you right now at some speed v. And this one is moving down and away at also some speed v. I don't know what v is. v depends on how big this loop is and how fast it's spinning. right? It depends on how far you are from the rotation axis and how quickly the angular frequency or angular speed that this loop is rotating. So I'm going to make some substitutions. I'm going to substitute in for theta the angular frequency and or the angular speed and the time. For the velocity v, I'm going to substitute in the angular speed and position r. Here. Next step, I'm going to get rid of R. Again, R, how, how wide this is? Well, it's the width of the loop divided by 2. So R is the width of the loop divided by 2. Notice I've written a regular W here, not omega. So this has two W-looking characters in this equation. Be sure you keep them apart. For now, omega with a little serifs on the top is due to is the angular speed, the W sans serif, right, without those little marks, is the width. So I replace the distance from the rotation axis to the width over 2. Now I have 2 here, I have divided by 2 there, those 2's cancel. I have the length of the wire here. I have the width of the loop. Length times width is area, right? Area is length times width, so I replace the length times the width with the area. I do add one term, n. Your book 
kind of just throws that in there, so I'll go as well. All the der derivation we've done up to this point is for a single loop of wire. But if you have multiple loops of wire going around, each loop of wire generates an EMF, so you have to add all of them together. So multiply the number of loops of wire, in this case it would just be one, but it could be hundreds or thousands of loops of wire, times the magnetic field strength, times the area, times the angular frequency. So this together, these four terms, NB, A, and omega, I'm going to call E naught, the EMF. This is the maximum EMF. This is as big as the EMF can get. Because the last term, this sine term, sine just because goes between minus 1, 0, and 1, right? That's all sine you can do. Sine of any number is somewhere between minus 1 and 1. So the maximum EMF you can get out of, of this electric motor is equal to the number of turns of wire times the strength of the magnetic field, no magnetic field, no electric generator, times the area of the loop, so the bigger the area, the bigger the EMF you generate, times omega, which is the speed. So spinning it faster generates a bigger EMF, just like pulling out the, you know, pulling the uh, rail across, changing the area in that motional EMF argument we had before gives you a bigger EMF. So the speed at which the flux changes uh, is effect, affects the EMF. So I'm going to have these four things equal to epsilon naught. That's just the maximum possible EMF times this sinusoidal function. So if you know what the angular speed is and you know what time t is, you can tell me what the EMF is at any point in time, but it can't be above E naught, right? E naught is the maximum value. So I'm going to look at this plot. So what does a sinusoidal function look, uh, this EMF look like? Once again, the maximum EMF that you can get, E naught, is equal to the number of turns of wire or loops of wire in your electric generator times the strength of the magnetic field provided by the magnets, times the area within the loop of wire, times how quickly this loop is turning, right? And the omega here is the angular speed. The EMF at any point in time oscillates. It's equal to the maximum EMF times this sine function, which of course, omega stays constant with time if the generator is spinning at a constant rate. What changes with time, of course, is time. So when you plot the EMF as a function of time, you will get something that looks like this. Alternating current. The current goes up to some maximum EMF, falls through zero down to some minimum EMF, and then back up. Now, this alternating current, that's one of the reasons it's so useful to use alternating current. Not only is it good for energy transport over long distances, high power lines, it's more efficient to push AC current through them than DC current. It's also easier to generate, at least for motional EMF, it's easier to generate alternating current using these rotating coils of wire. You can add brushes to your electric generator and begin to turn AC current into DC current. And what brushes do basically is it keeps the current positive. So here the current is positive, then it goes to negative, then it goes to positive. When the current's about to go negative, what happens in the generator is the terminals that the motor is hooked to switch. And you get something that looks like, rather than having all positive and negative, you end up getting all positive. current. Now it's still alternating with time, but it's going in the same direction. Attaching this to other circuit elements like capacitors and inductors, what you can end up doing is smoothing out, specifically capacitors, you can end up smoothing out the alternating current and create wiggly, almost flat DC current. Actually, it wouldn't be that high, it would be the average, it would be in the middle. 
So you ended up creating DC current. And the advantage of DC current is all of our electronic devices use DC current, batteries run on DC current, um, electrical devices, computers run DC. So you have to have this kind of, some, some kind of a, basically a converter that changes alternating current into direct current to use it in our electronic devices. So this is an electric generator. Now I have an example of an electric generator here. Just give me one moment. So I've turned the focus so the focus should work. So there are coils of wire. You can see the copper wire on one end or the other. On each side here you can see there's a permanent magnet on either side and this whole thing rotates. So I'll put it up this way. This rotates around So by physically spinning this, I'm generating a current in the wire. Now nothing is attached to the leads here right now, so no current is actually flowing. This is fairly easy to spin. But if I held up, if I put a load on this, if I put a device or a resistor on this and tried to spin this, it become more difficult. Now because I need this to spin, I can hook this up to some physical source that will allow this thing to rotate, right? I could, could hook it up to um, a bicycle and bike around, or I could hook it up to a windmill or a water, you know, a hydroelectric dam or anything that, a turbine, anything that spins. And as that object spins, it generates electricity. Conversely, electric motors, it's the same design, but it has the opposite intent. In an electric motor, you supply the electricity and we get out its rotation. So an electric generator and an electric motor are basically the same device. It's just what do you supply to it and what do you take away from it. For an electric generator, you supply motion, kinetic energy, and you get out electrical energy, current. In a motor, you supply electrical energy, current, and you get out mechanical energy, kinetic energy, right? You get uh, rotation. So electric generators and electric motors are basically the same device, just used in two different ways.